Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be going over care of the pediatrical, pediatrical, pediatric patient with neurological issues. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm gonna ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're gonna love it, so go ahead and give it a thumbs up now. Subscribe to my channel if you have done so already. And don't forget, I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX reviews. You can reserve your spot for review part one and part two by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. If you're a current nursing student and you are struggling, you really need to pass your exams, check out the audio lessons I have available. Again, my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Before we get started, I want to start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, just fast forward. If you are, close your eyes by your head. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus, for another opportunity to go over um, concepts and content, Lord. I ask that you please help every single listener, every single viewer, Father God, every single student that have come to this channel for their own specific purpose. Lord, I ask that you please help them to understand the information that's being presented. Help them to be able to think critically through these type of questions, Father God, and help them, Lord, when they see this content again, Lord, they can answer that question correctly. Father God, I pray for their support system, the people who are helping them, the people who are rooting them on and telling them not to be discouraged. I ask that you please strengthen them, Father God, Lord. Every single student, Lord, I ask that you please give them the discipline to study accordingly, Father God, and remove those distractions from their lives. Thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. A nurse is assessing a three-year-old child with suspected nuchal rigidity. Which assessment finding would indicate nuchal rigidity? Positive Koenig sign, negative Brudinsky sign, positive Holman sign, or negative Babinski sign? What do you guys say? And the correct answer is one, positive Koenig sign. So with that positive Koenig sign, let's go back to the question. I want to point something out to you in this whole question, that two, uh, these two words, nuchal rigidity. When you hear nuchal rigidity, one of the first things that needs to be going on in your mind is possible meningitis, right? So um, positive Koenig sign is um, a sign of possible meningitis. So that's why that's the answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choice. Um, to negative Brudinsky sign, that, well, the Brudinsky sign, that shows nuchal irritation, we're already thinking this patient most likely has meningitis. So if anything, that Brudinsky sign would be what? Positive, not negative. Choice three, a positive Holman sign. Positive Holman sign, that is a possible DVT. If someone has a positive Holman sign, that doesn't mean they have a deep vein thrombosis, but they possibly may. That has nothing to do with this nuchal rigidity or this meningitis that we're suspecting the patient has. But you see number one, positive Koenig sign? Yes, because that positive Koenig sign lets you know patient's got what? Nuchal rigidity. And then choice four, negative Babinski sign. That's expected after a year of age, okay? When it comes to the Babinski sign, um, that's showing that um, there's no um, neurological deficits. So for this particular question, again, we're suspecting meningitis. The correct answer is going to be one positive uh, Koenig's sign. Next question. A nurse is caring for a child with spina bifida. The child's mother asked the nurse what she did to cause a birth defect. What's the nurse's best response? One, advanced age of conception is one of the major causes of the defect. Two, it's a common complication of amniocentesis. Three, it's been linked to maternal alcohol consumption during pregnancy. Or four, many factors may contribute to it, but the exact cause is unknown. And the correct answer is four. Many factors may contribute to it. What is a major factor that may contribute? Um, not having um, folic acid, right? Not enough intake of folic acid can cause a neural tube defect such as spina bifida, but the truth is the exact cause is unknown. So number four is the correct answer. Many factors can contribute to it, but the exact cause is unknown. Now look, let's look at the other choices. One, advanced age at uh, conception is one of the major causes of the defect. No. Um, advanced age can cause other issues, but uh, spina bifida is not one of them. That's not a major cause. Choice two, it's a common complication of amniocentesis. No, um, amniocentesis helps to diagnose a, a cause of um, 
disorder, right? While the fetus is still in the womb, but that's absolutely wrong. It's not a common complication. That's wrong. And then choice three, it's been linked to maternal alcohol consumption during pregnancy. No, when it comes to drinking alcohol, that can cause the fetus to have, you know, mental defects, heart defects, but not spina bifida. So the correct answer is number four. Again, decreased intake of folic acid or not enough intake of folic acid definitely is a contributing factor, but the exact cause is unknown. A 14-year-old diagnosed with head trauma following an MVA's prescribed IV administration of mannitol. Which assessment would help determine the effectiveness of the medication? One, BUN. Two, cardiac rhythm. Three, urinary output. Or four, serum potassium. And guys, the correct answer is three, urinary output. Why? Okay, let's talk about this medication, mannitol. What does it cause? Diuresis. So if we want to see if this medication is working, we're going to look at the urina urinary output to see if that patient's losing fluids. We give this uh, type of medication to patients who would have something like increased intracranial pressure. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, BUN. Well, BUN is going to be checked before we give mannitol. I want you to think about it. If this medication causes diuresis, don't we need to make sure that that kidney is actually functioning properly before we give that medication to the patient? Absolutely. So that's wrong. Two, cardiac rhythm. And also four, serum potassium. These you're going to check. So while the patient's on mannitol, they're losing fluids. What comes out with the fluids? Electrolytes, right? So we're going to be checking that patient's electrolytes to make sure there's not an electrolyte imbalance, especially potassium, because potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range, 3.5 to 5. Anything outside of that range, you can cause what? Cardiac dysrhythmias. So choice two and four, we would continually be checking while the patient is on this medication, um, mannitol. But urine output's the correct answer because if we want to know this medication's working, that's what we're going to check, the urine output. A child with an elevated temperature and change in behavior scheduled for a lumbar puncture. Which intervention should the nurse perform to alleviate the child's pain and fear of the lumbar puncture? One, sedate the child with fentanyl per order. Two, apply a topical anesthetic to the skin five to 10 minutes before the puncture. Three, have the parent hold the child in his or her lap during the tap procedure. Or four, have the child inhale small amounts of nitrous oxide before the puncture. And guys, number one's the correct answer because go back to the question. It says, which intervention should the nurse perform to alleviate the child's pain and fear. Well, guess what? If they're sedated, how are they going to have pain and fear? Right? Let's look at the wrong answer choices too. Apply topical anesthetic to the skin five to 10 minutes. That's too soon. You're going to have to apply that about an hour before the procedure. So that's false. Choice three, have the parent hold the child in his or her lap during the tap procedure. Well, that child being in the parent's lap, that's going to kind of alleviate the fear because the parental figure is like a safety blanket, a security blanket to the child. However, that's not going to decrease the pain. It can help with the fear, but it's not going to decrease the pain. That's number one. And number two, look at what we're doing for the patient. The patient's getting a lumbar puncture. How are we going to do that if they're sitting on their parent's lap? Does that make any sense? No. So that's wrong. And then choice four, have the child inhale small amounts of nitrous oxide, nitrous inhalation of not, not <clears throat> inhalation of nitrous oxide is not recommended for this procedure. The correct answer is sedation, choice number one. The nurse is aware that antimicrobial therapy to treat meningitis should be instituted immediately after one admission to the nursing unit, two initiation of IV therapy, three identification of the causative organism, or four collection of cerebral spinal fluid and blood for culture. And guys, the correct answer is for collection of cerebral spinal fluid and blood for culture. As soon as the, we even suspect that this patient's got meningitis, the first thing we're going to do, that patient's going to go in isolation. Immediately after that patient goes in isolation, we're going to cor correct, collect blood and um, um, cerebral spinal fluid, right? Because we're going to have to do a culture, and that culture is going to take a couple days. It's going to take a couple days to grow for us to figure out exactly what is in the cerebral spinal fluid, which is supposed to be a sterile environment, and what's in the blood. Well, guess what? While we're waiting for those results, 
Do you think we're just going to have the patient there and them not be on antibiotics? Absolutely not, because time is of the essence. And we cannot afford for this patient to have meningitis and they weren't on antibiotics. So as soon as they're admitted, they're going to go to isolation. As soon as they go to isolation, we're going to collect cerebral spinal fluid and blood. And immediately after we collect that, the patient goes on broad spectrum antibiotics. And then when the culture comes back, you know, the the antibiotics that that patient's on at the moment may be changed depending on the culture, but that's what you're going to do in that order. So number one's wrong, admission um, to the unit, we still need to get that culture first. Two, initiation of IV therapy, that's going to come later. Three, identification of the causative organ organism, that's going to take a couple days because we're not going to be able to identify the causative organism until we have that culture, and the culture is going to take a couple days before we can get the results. So number four is the correct answer choice. A nurse is caring for a client diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. What's the most appropriate goal for this client? One, acknowledgement of lifelong disabilities. Two, full independence in activities of daily living. Three, acceptance of the ultimate prognosis of mus muscular dystrophy. Four, intensive physical therapy to prevent joint contractures. <laughs> All right, guys, and the correct answer is two, unfortunately, but that's the correct answer. Acceptance of ultimate prognosis of muscular dystrophy. Guys, this disorder, the patient has progressive muscle weakness. What does that word progressive mean? That means as time goes on, it only gets worse, okay? There is no cure. So our biggest concerns, because remember, you have, you have respiratory muscles. You need muscles to help you breathe. Our concern is it gets to the point where those respiratory muscles are affected and that patient's going um, to go into respiratory failure. But anyway, um, three is the correct answer. For a patient with this type of diagnosis, their life expectancy is about 15 to 20 years. Okay. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, acknowledgement of lifelong difficulties. Not only that, but the ultimate outcome. The ultimate outcome, which is number three. Look at choice number two, full independence. Let's stop right there. That's not possible. They're not gonna have full independence. That is a, a, an unrealistic expectation. So that's wrong. And then choice number four, intensive physical therapy. Okay, that part's correct, but let's keep going. To prevent uh, joint muscle contractures. No. The reason that patient's getting intensive... In, I'm sorry, guys. I can't speak today. Forgive me. The reason that this patient is getting intense physical therapy is to manage. Manage joint contractures. We're not going to be able to prevent it. Again, guys, what is this disorder? Progressive muscle weakness. So um, we're not going to prevent it. They're going to get contractions, but we want to be able to manage manage it and just have the patient live and move to their optimal level of functioning, however low that may be. So the correct answer choice, guys, is three. Which of the nursing assessment data would be given priority for a child with clinical findings related to tubercular meningitis? One, onset and character fever. Two, degree and extent of nuchal rigidity. Three, signs of increased intracranial pressure. Or four, occurrence of urinary and fecal incontinence. All right, before I tell you the answer, I'm going to remind you, whenever you get a test question asking you about priority, in your mind, you always need to think about the option of what will kill your patient the fastest or keep them alive the longest. So when we look at the one, two, three, and four, what is the obvious answer? Three. Signs of increased intracranial pressure. Look at choices one and two, onset of uh, character fever, degree and extent of nuchal rigidity. These are important factors to assess, but ICP is more dangerous. ICP will kill you much faster than anything else on this list. Choice four, occurrence of urinary and fecal incontinence. Again, that is something to, important to assess, but it's not gonna kill you. It's not gonna kill you as fast as increased intracranial pressure is. So that's why choice number three is the correct answer. A nurse has just worked 
had just started working in a neurology unit. What statement by the nurse would indicate an adequate knowledge of seizures? One, clonic seizure activity is usually interpreted as falling. Two, it's not unusual to develop seizures after head injury because of brain trauma. Three, focal discharge in the brain may lead to absence seizures that can go unnoticed. Four, the, I'm gonna try to say this word, elliptic, Epileptogenic focus in the brain needs a multiple stimuli because it will discharge and cause a seizure. If you're new to my channel, I apologize. I'm telling you now I can't speak. I have um I have an issue. I just can't speak. So my apologies. All right, so <laughs> the correct answer, guys, is two. It's not unusual to develop seizures after head injury because of brain trauma. And that's absolutely the correct answer. Um, the patient can have brain trauma and and here's the thing that they can have brain trauma and they won't they won't initially like have the seizure right away it can be delayed they have brain trauma and we'll see that seizure happen after 48 hours but remember the seizure that's like over firing of those neurons and what the brain so when there's been a traumatic injury to the brain that will increase the risk of possibly that patient going into seizures one clonic seizure activity is usually interpreted as falling no, that's atonic seizures, so that's wrong. Choice three, focal discharge in the brain may lead to absent seizures that go unnoticed. Um, absent seizures are what? They're general. They're generalized seizures, okay? So um, that's wrong. And then four, the elliptogenic focus in the brain needs multiple stimuli because it will discharge and cause a seizure. That's not true. The focus already has hyperexcitable neurons already right so that can't possibly be true number two is the correct answer again uh, i apologize guys i have a speech impediment i've had it since i was a kid i was in speech therapy for years this is speech therapy for years that you're getting what you get now but i know the information i'm going to teach it to you the best i can i feel guilty about it sometimes so forgive me next question a nurse is providing teaching to an adolescent who has been prescribed fentanyl for seizures. What information should the nurse include in this teaching plan? Select all that applies. How do you treat select all that apply? We treat them as true or false. Individually, you have to go through each answer choice. And if it's true, you keep it. If it's false, you get rid of it. Don't try to group your answers together. That is why a lot of you guys are getting select all that apply wrong. Okay, you have to treat them as true or false. So we're talking about Dilantin. We're talking about this medication, Fentolin, okay? One, brush your teeth using a soft toothbrush. Is that true or false? True. Why? We know this medication could cause gingival hyperplasia. So you're going to teach them to brush with a soft toothbrush. Two, you can stop taking this medication when your seizure stops. Is that true or false? That is false. Let me tell you, and not only this medication, but all neurological psych medications, but patients should never stop it abruptly because stopping that medication abruptly can cause the patient to have seizures. They have to be weaned off. Okay. So we know that's false. Um, where was I? Three, a rash is normal while taking this medication. No, a rash may possibly be an adverse reaction you teach that patient if you develop a rash don't take your next dose and make sure you notify the healthcare provider immediately because an uncommon but lethal adverse reaction is stephen johnson syndrome this is possibly deadly and we don't want the patient to get this obviously so that's um false four you'll need to have your blood work done frequently true if we know anything about this medication we know that has a the uh, narrow therapeutic range, that therapeutic range is 10 to 20. And so we're going to keep checking the blood just to make sure the patient has a therapeutic level in their blood. And last, you should wear an ID bracelet indicating that you're taking this drug. Of course, because there's so many drug interactions, if that patient passes out, something happens, we need to know that they're on this particular medication. So that is true. The correct answer choices are one, four, and five.
A nurse is providing teaching to the parents of a child diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. Which statements by the nurse are correct? Select all that apply. One, braces and mobility aids will be needed to maintain flexibility of the joints. True. Why? Because they're at high risk for contractors. Two, continuous exercise will help your child overcome muscle weakness and prevent the progression of the disease. False. I just told you this is a progressive disorder. That means as time get, goes on, it only gets worse, right? So there is no prevention. So that's false. Choice three, monitoring for spinal deformities is very important as they can interfere with respiratory function. True or false? True. So that patient can develop something like kyphosis. And guess what? That's going to cause the lungs to not be able to expand appropriately the way that it should. And that the lungs not expand, expanding appropriately, that can lead to an infection such as what? Pneumonia. Um, choice four, avoid letting your child stand as this will cause undue stress on the lower extremities. False. We want to increase or strengthen the muscle tone as much as possible. So we don't want that patient just sitting or lying down or doing nothing. We want them moving about. So that's false. How about five? Eventually, your child will have to depend upon a wheelchair for mobility. Is that true or is that false? That's true. Again, guys, this is a progressive disorder. As time goes on, it's only going to get worse. That is true. A five-year-old child diagnosed with cerebral palsy has just been prescribed oral baclofen. Which assessment finding by the nurse would indicate effective drug therapy? One, the child's exhibiting less spasticity. Two, the child has less frequent seizures. Three, the child no longer sleeps during the daytime. Or four, the child's better able to concentrate on mental activities. And guys, the correct answer is one, the child is exhibiting less spasticity. Why is that the answer? Well, let's go to the medication, baclofen. What is that? A skeletal muscle relaxer. So if we want to see if the medication's working, we have to know the indication. What is, or the action, I should say, what does this medication do? It's supposed to relax the muscles. So if we want to see if it's working, what do we expect to see? Those relaxed muscles, we expect to see a less, I can't say that word, spasticity of the muscle, less of those contractions. I can say the word contractions, less of those contractions of the muscle. So that's how we know that medication's working. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices too. The child has less frequent seizures. That would be not for a muscle relaxant, but that would be for an anti-eleptic drug, an anti-seizure drug. But that's not what we're talking about now. We're talking about a muscle relax, a skeletal muscle relaxant. So that's not it. Choice three, the child no longer sleeps during the daytime. Again, this medication relaxes the muscles. So if we want to see if this medication is working, what does that have to do with them not sleeping during the daytime? Matter of fact, something you need to know about skeletal muscle relaxants, they can cause daytime drowsiness. And so that's important to teach because we don't want that patient operating heavy machinery while they're on this type of medication. And then choice four, the child is better able to concentrate on um, mental activities. Not only does that have nothing to do with trying to see if this medication is actually working, right? But a side effect of this medication is confusion. So it's very likely that we'll see um, that this child will have a hard time concentrating because that's a side effect of the medication. So the correct answer, guys, is number one. Um, one more thing I want to bring to your attention in this question, they're talking about a patient that has cerebral palsy. This is a congenital disorder, guys, and it basically affects like movement and muscle tone. That's why they're on baclofen. Next question. The parents of a child with a history of seizures ask the nurse why it's difficult to maintain therapeutic levels of fentanyl. Which statement by the nurse would be most accurate? One, a drop in plasma drug will lead to a toxic state. Two, the capacity to metabolize the drug becomes overwhelmed in time. Three, small increments in dosage lead to sharp increases in plasma levels. Or four, large increases in dosage lead to more rapid stabilizing therapeutic effect. And the correct answer is three. 
small increments in dosage lead to a sharp increases in plasma drug levels. And remember, the therapeutic range is very small. 10 to 20, it is, that therapeutic range is extremely narrow. And that's why we gotta keep paying attention to keep it within that therapeutic range. A nurse is caring for a child with a spinal cord lesion at the level of the seventh cranial vertebrae. The child becomes flush, diaphoretic, hypertensive, and reports a headache and blurred vision. What is the priority nursing action? One, assess the bladder for distension and slowly drain if distended. Two, administer antihypertensive and pain medication. Three, remove external stimuli and tight clothing. Four, administer a stool softener and perform manual anal stimulation. And the correct answer is one. Even though all of the choices are correct, you're going to do this, right? But the question is asking you, what's the priority? If you have to only choose one thing for your patient to keep them alive or to keep them out of danger, you have the only one thing to do, what would it be? One, assess the bladder for distension and slowly drain it if extended. Why? We're suspecting autonomic dysreflexia. So we have to um, remove that stimulus, Okay. Anytime, let's go back to the question. Anytime that you've seen a spinal cord injury, diaphoresis, hypertension, you better suspect autonomic dysreflexia. Those three, you better suspect autonomic dysreflexia. And the first thing you're going to do is assess for um, a distended bladder. And if that bladder is distended, you're going to drain it slowly. All of the other choices are correct. You're going to give them antihypertensive medication. You're going to give them pain med analgesics for the pain. You're going to remove external stimuli. You know, maybe there's a pen on the bed or anything that's touching their skin. Maybe there's wrinkle in the sheets, right? You're going to remove that. You're going to remove tight clothing. You're going to give them a stool softener because we don't want that patient to have an obstruction um, to be constipated. Perform uh, ma a manual anal stimulation. You're going to do all of that. But the very first thing you're going to do is assess that bladder and make sure that it's not distended. The nurse is teaching a 16-year-old client how to self-catheterize following a spinal cord injury. Which statements by the nurse are correct, select all that apply. One, always use a latex catheter. False. The fact that it said always, you should have known that was not the answer. Why? Because I always teach you stay away from the all-inclusives. Always, never, only, nope wrong. Look at this. Always use a latex catheter. Let me tell you something. A patient that has a spinal cord injury, they're at high risk for latex allergy. So absolutely not. Two, drink caffeinated drinks sparingly. True. Why? Because caffeinated drinks obviously have caffeine. What do we know about caffeine? Number one, it's a bladder irritant. Number two, it can work act as a diuretic, right? And we don't want the bladder to be extended. So we're going to teach them to if they're drinking coffee, drink it very sparingly. So that's true. Three, use sterile technique. False. Remember, this is self-catheterization. You're not doing it for the patient. They're doing it for themselves. This is self-catheterization. They're going to use clean technique. Four, self-catheterize according to a schedule. True. This is called what? Bladder training. Absolutely. Five, maintain a regular pattern of fluid intake over the day. True. Why do we want a, a, um, a regular uh, pattern? Think about it. That regular pattern should coincide with the self-catheterization. Everything that goes in has to come out, right? So that regular pattern, you're going to establish a rag regular pattern for fluid intake and also a regular pattern for that self-catheterization. Because again, if it goes in, it has to go out. And guys, we're down to our last question. The parents of a 10-year-old tell the nurse that they're concerned that their child may have a concussion after being hit in the head by a soccer ball during a game. The child, fully oriented, remembers being hit with the ball and the vital signs within normal range. What is the nurse's most appropriate response? One, it is unlikely that your child has a concussion if there's no loss of consciousness. Two, your child will need uninterrupted sleep tonight in order for any damage to heal. Three, seek medical attention if there's any change in condition in the next two to three days. Four, there's no need to concern as there's no need for concern as children are very resilient at this age. And guys, the correct answer is three, seek medical attention. 
seek medical attention if there is any change in condition for the next two to three days. You teach that parent, if you see any decline in cognitive function, all of a sudden they're confused, all of a sudden they're disoriented, all of a sudden they're lethargic, you see any decline, you need to report that immediately because sometimes um, even though the patient didn't lose consciousness, that doesn't mean that um, there was a trauma to the brain. It doesn't mean that there wasn't um, a concussion, okay? Now let's look at the wrong answers. One, it's unlikely your child has a concussion if there was no loss of consciousness. That is wrong. It can happen even if that patient does not lose um, consciousness. Two, your child will need uninterrupted... Let's think critically through this answer choice. The child just got hit in the head. We're concerned. We're going to tell the parents that the child needs uninterrupted sleep. All right. So if they sleep uninterrupted, how are we going to know if there's been a change in their level of consciousness? How are we going to know if they're suddenly confused or agitated or irritated or lethargic or disoriented? How are we going to know? Because they're sleeping. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. You know, that's wrong. Next four, there's no need for concern. Let's stop right there. Because in nursing, if you're ever going to be anything, you're going to be concerned. You're going to be concerned. That's how you keep your patients alive. So you never say there's no need for concern. You know that's wrong. Number three is the correct answer choice. All right, guys, that is it for this video. Please let me know what you thought this, about this video. Let me know if you'd like to see a part two, if you'd like to see more neurological issues in the pediatric patient. And also let me know how you'd like me to present that information. Would you like it in a question answer format such as this video? Would you like it in an activity such as a Kahoot or maybe in a lecture where, you know, I'm basically teaching out of a book. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Guys, thank you so much for watching the video and you guys will catch me on the next video.